I was thinking about what we covered last time and some new thoughts occurred to me. So the beginning of this uh, session will extend what gains we made last time. How objectivism avoids intrinsicism's death spiral. First of all, I'm calling it intrinsicism, which is a little more apt term than realism. Realism sounds like something good, but intrinsicism is the idea that the universal is out there and all we have to do is find it in the concrete, the insight view that's there. What is this death spiral? Well, it starts, the first swoop around, is the theory of Plato, Aristotle, and Locke, the, the best you could get before Ayn Rand, is that a concept is based upon the universal element in the concrete. So it begins by leaving out half of reality. That is, the particular differing parts are not referred to by the concept as merely the manness in men that's referred to, not their individual characteristics like their height, their weight, their fact that they are two-legged. Those are considered accidental. Now, Aristotle wouldn't use that term, but this is where the intrinsic theory leads you. The universal part is what the concept grasps and the rest is ignored. Now, if abstraction means subtraction, leaving out the particular, ignoring it, then as you get to higher abstractions, which is where we're going today, you're leaving out more and more. Each widening subtracts content from your concept. So, for example, triangle drops half of the, you know, I'm using these fractions as symbols, it's not measurable. But triangle drops half, polygon drops three quarters, rectilinear figure drops seven eighths, and if you get to existent, you've dropped everything. So on the intrinsicist view, the Platonic, even Aristotelian, even Lockean view, wider is emptier, less valuable ignorable, really. Principles being the widest of generalizations, they're a form of proposition, but the same thing applies. Principles deal with very wide concepts and are therefore completely vapid. They're what, for the intrinsicists, they're what Americans regard them as, hot air. You see how that follows from this idea that we're subtracting content as we get more abstract. Objectivism holds that abstraction is interrelation, the establishing of measurement categories. Concepts include the whole concrete, not just some universal part. The common or distinguishing characteristics are only the means to integrating the entities, the existence, the things out there. They are not, they are a means, not an end. So wider for objectivism means more value, more content, more power. Principles are powerful. Principles for objectivism are the mountaintop view. So can contrast that. You climb a mountain and you can see the whole terrain and you know, oh, so if I want to get to that lake, I have to go that way and climb over that hill, which you couldn't see if you were right in the terrain. That's the objectivist view because you're getting wider and wider, seeing more and more. But on the realist view, you're peering deeper and deeper into one concrete, looking for its essence qua whatever it is you're talking about. So you're getting narrower and narrower and emptier and emptier. You know what Hegel said? I, mean, I don't have to tell you people what Hegel said. He said that when you get to existence, 
you've dropped out all differences and you're left with nothing. Existence abstracts from all differences, therefore it leaves out all identity and the thought of being and the thought of non-being pass into each other as equivalent. Existence is non-existence. That's the first contradiction in the dialectic. So that's the logical, that's the death spiral, all right. You're dead when you got there. When A is non-A and existence is non-existence, you've got no place further to go. So I arranged the gunfight at the not okay corral between the intrinsicist view and the objectivist view. And we're gonna fight it out. You know the gunfight at the okay corral, right? In the turn of the century, big famous last of the gun battles. The intrinsicist view is that number, we're applying it here because it's simple. Number is that which is not one as opposed to two, not two as opposed to three, not three as opposed to four. It's neither one, nor two, nor three. It's just pure number. The objectivist view is that number is that which is either one or two or three or some but any specific quantity measured. That's a little difference. It's neither one nor two versus it's either one or two. But there you have the essence of the difference between objectivism and intrinsicism or realism. Objectivism embraces differences, either one or two or three. Realism looks for that which doesn't differ. Remember that quote from Bram Blanchard, there's nothing invariant, concepts are in trouble, there's nothing invariant. We're looking for the variables. We're looking for what variables. And I push this a little further in my mind just come before coming here. And I think the difference is objectivism says you can ignore differences that don't matter, that aren't relevant, and intrinsicism says you can find something that doesn't differ. Now, I won't say you never can find something that doesn't differ. All triangles have three sides. That doesn't differ. But what the sides are it differs. You can't find three identical sides in every triangle. But you see the difference between ignoring differences that don't change anything and saying there's an element that's identical in the concretes. Years ago, I read the start of Euclid's Elements, the famous geometry text he wrote. Proposition two is length is breadth, uh, no, a line is breadthless length. And I was breathless and breadthless. Breadth, you know, no width, length. And everybody thinks this. It's not just you. What's the line? Oh, it has zero width, but it has length. It has, it has so what is that, one dimension? And a point has zero dimensions. Wrong. A line is a three-dimensional shape considered from the aspect of what follows from its extension in one dimension as opposed to what follows from its width or its thickness, its depth. It has three, every actual shape has three dimensions. There aren't even any two-dimensional shapes. That's already an abstraction. But when you get to line, it's not that there's an object in your mind or in reality that has no width, no breadth. It's that you look at what follows from length, not from width. 
So you see the difference there? You make up a world. You could make up a world of pure geometrical forms, lines without width, uh, breadth, as he calls it, points without extension. And then the question comes up, how does that relate to reality? Everything in reality is width and thick. How does it, how, I guess reality doesn't live up to our mathematical concepts. That's the nature of this ugly world we live in. You see how everything gets thrown off once you start thinking in terms of reifying your abstractions. I ignored width, so what I'm talking about is something without width. No, it's there. You're selectively attending to another attribute. You're not denying that the first attribute is there. You're not denying that things differ in length. You're not saying all lengths are the same. You're embracing variation in one dimension, on one CCD. Okay. The reason why we don't say there's an identical universal and that's what concepts are all about is that it isn't there. The nominalists are right about that. The universal does not exist. To be is to be something. There's no length as such. There's this length and that length, and this length is different from that length. There's no blueness as such. There's no blurry identical attribute. There's only this shade of blue and that shade of blue. It's completely specific. Existence is identity. You cannot separate existence and identity. To be is to be something specific. Things differ. This is this and that is that. They are not the same. We treat them as the same when the, their, their differences fall within a range. That's what's the same, the falling within the rangeness. Universals don't exist, but concepts are still objective, not subjective. Heretofore, before 1966, the alternative was thought of as if the universals aren't out there, then it's deuces wild. Then we make them up. Then concepts are just creations of our conventions. They have no basis in reality. And Ayn Rand grasped that there is between the intrinsic and the subject, between, no, transcending discarding the intrinsic and the subjective theories, there's the objective. Here is the seminal quote from Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. None of these other schools regard concepts as objective, i.e., as neither revealed nor invented. God, she's great with words. You know, revealed or invented. What a great way to oppose the intrinsic and the subjective. Neither revealed nor invented but is produced by man's consciousness in accordance with the facts of reality. As mental integrations of factual data, not whims, computed by man. Notice that term, computed by man. She keeps tying it to mathematics because people get that math is objective. You, math is the easiest area to see, well, numbers don't exist in nature. Man creates numbers and math, but it's not loosey-goosey deuces or wild. Math follows reality. It's easy. God knows people deny that, but the common man can see that. So she says, computed, factual data computed by man as the products of a cognitive method of classification, not of insight, of classification whose processes must be performed by man, but whose content is dictated by reality. That's the objective. And that's the fundamental breakthrough of all Ayn Rand's breaks, breakthroughs is that. And I once asked her, how long did you have this idea of objective not either subjective or intrinsic. And she said, 
Oh, I, I think I've always thought that. Well, no one else ever did. So let's turn now with that as background to the question that was raised in the question period, uh, I think by Jack Crawford, that what do, uh, no, it was by someone else. What do concepts do for us? We're raising the question, what do concepts do for us? Plato would say, do? What a vulgar notion. Concepts are the gateway to a higher realm. We should kneel before them. They are to be contemplated and admired. Do for us? Objectivism says they enable us to stay in existence. They keep us alive rather than dead. How? First of all, maybe I should say, how to, uh, is it true that concepts keep us alive? Imagine that we suddenly lost all our concepts. Some super electromagnetic pulse does to us, our brains what they supposedly can do to computers. It wipes out wholesale memory and storage. So you're now back the way you were at age one. I'll even give you first level concepts. You can have cookie and tree and doggy and uh, man, river. Okay, now feed yourself. Go to Walmart, take out your credit card. I don't think so. You can no more survive than that one year old can survive without concepts. People, you know, people tend to think that the problem with uh, infants is that they haven't got control of the muscles. No, the problem is they're ignorant. The problem is they, they don't have concepts. As the severely retarded show, who can't take care of themselves, even though they have perfect control of their muscles. So if we didn't have concepts, we would be back at age one-ish, unable to survive beyond the next meal. We wouldn't be able to use our computers. I mean, without the iPhone, how could we survive, right? I mean, everyone gets that. Now, how, do the, how do concepts do it for us? They do it by condensing, condensing. That is a very different perspective than historical perspective. Concepts wholesale concretes by condensing the many into one. And this is where our friend the crow enters. A crow can keep track of the difference between one object and particularly people, one person and two people, two people and three people. Smarter ones can do three versus four, but beyond that, it's just many people. So the reported um, event was that if many people went into an area with crows and all but one of them came out, the crows thought everyone had left because it was many in, many out, and the crows reappeared in the, in the trees. Whereas if two people went in and one came out, the crow knew that one was left. So a crow can keep track of <clears throat> perceptually one versus two, two versus three, maybe three versus four. But man can count. He can say 25 went in, only 24 came out, so there's one left. What is counting? Ayn Rand says accounting is an automatized lightning-like process of reducing the number of mental units one has to hold. So 25 is 25. Three syllables, but it's one mental unit. It's two symbols, but you treat it as one mental unit. So going back to this slide, Concepts enable us to survive, to live by condensing 
which means connecting the many to a one, permitting us to reduce the number of units we have to hold. So the perspective I want to stress, and this is more me than Ayn Rand, although I think it's in Ayn Rand, but we're now in the information age. A concept is an information handling tool an information handling tool. It is not the portal to the world of forms. It is not a linguistic convention that enables you to get stroked by other people or stroke them. A concept is an information handling tool which has three aspects. Unit economy, the many to one condensation. Storage, and retrieval. So as Ayn Rand says, using another information storing device, the file folder, since concepts represent a system of cognitive classification, a given concept serves, speaking metaphorically, as a file folder. A file folder. To do what? In which one files what? Thank you. Who said that? Great. All the particular concretes. Wrong. I believed that for 40 years, so I'm glad you said that. I don't have to embarrass myself as much. I believe that for 40 years that the concept, because there's a many-one connection, that the concept files all the particulars. But if you introspect for a few seconds, which apparently I didn't do, for 40 years. Do you, do you know all the, do you have a list somewhere of all the tables that you've ever perceived? We'll, we'll let you free from all the tables you will ever perceive. Do you have a list? Do you remember in January 15th, 1984, the guy you saw standing next to that tree? I don't think so. You have, the concept man, but it does not file the particulars. Yeah, you have a few examples in there, you know, arch examples of human beings that you can call to mind. But that's not what the concept files. Now look at what follows here. Not only did I not introspect, I didn't extrospect closely on the language. His knowledge of the existence it subsumes. It was Alan Gotthelf who corrected me on this. I always was thinking that the concept files the units. No, it files your knowledge of the units. Not your knowledge of them in, as a list of them. It's not just that I'm putting it inside consciousness rather than making it be existence in the external world. The concept man is the stuff that would be in a Wikipedia entry about man. Man evolved from the old world apes. Man is uh, um, not omnivorous, but what do they call it? When you, you can eat both meat and vegetables, man has two eyes and two legs. Man is a conceptual faculty. Man is a brain of this type that differs. All that stuff about man, not there's Bill and George and Mary and Socrates. And, it's not a list. It's the knowledge. It's the information that you want to use when you confront the next man. That's what's in the concept. So this was a revolution for me, and I cast no aspersions on any of you who have made this same mistake. It is not an integration of the units. And if you go back, well, let me go on. There's a many-one connection from a some units to the word. Not every unit you'll ever see is connected to the word, but there are two triangles, and you learn triangle applies to them. Now you work with the word triangle, and you store in with that word such things as triangles are half of a rectangle. Triangles have 180 degrees. Triangles can be congruent or not congruent. Triangles are congruent if the side, and an angle, and a side are equal. And all those things you learned in geometry. Triangles are very stable figures. They don't deform like uh, quadrilaterals can. 
So it's a knowledge that you store and the connection, the many one connection is not actually going out there to all the triangles, past, present, future. It is applicable to any triangle. It isn't a list of all the triangles. It is knowledge that is applicable to any triangle. And I think with this model, we can see the real power of the conceptual level comes with the higher order concepts. So if you form triangle, and by the same process you form quadrilateral, four-sided figure, pretty clear from the chart. Then you can get to polygon, which is in treating triangle and quadrilateral the way each of them treated the concretes from which they were formed. So we're now finally in the realm of abstractions from abstractions with polygon. And I want to uh, now dig into the process, which is pretty simple, but illuminating. Ayn Rand begins chapter three of ITOE with the statement, the process of cognition moves in two interacting directions toward wider integrations and more precise differentiations. Now that already leaves behind the history of philosophy because essentially theorists in philosophy throughout history have only considered one direction which I call up, you know, like from triangle and quadrilateral to polygon. That's been understood for a long, long time, getting wider. But she says there's another direction, getting narrower. And it turns out that if you take a dictionary and you look at the concepts and try to decide whether they are first level, widenings from first level or narrowings from first level. 90% of them are narrowings if they're not first level. 90% of the higher level concepts are narrowing the very category that's ignored by the whole history of philosophy. So if we start from the first level concept which we discussed last time, the wider integration is quite simple. It takes the earlier concepts as input and zooms out. So here we compare this. If we go back, you see the A, B, and C, and all this new diagram is, is backing off, zooming out to see, hey, there's a D there. So if you conceptualize tables on the far left by distinguishing them from a chair, which is the foil. When you go to furniture, you distinguish all those things from a car, say, or a window, or a wall, or a rug, or a light fixture that's built in, like that. That's not furniture. So you just take a bigger difference. What was near is still near, but what was far is now near. And I like to give the example, is Detroit near New York or far? Well, you can't say. Compared to Newark, New Jersey, Detroit is far from New York. Compared to the planet Jupiter, New York is very near Detroit. And compared to the Andromeda galaxy, Jupiter is very near New York. So it's a question of how far you're zoomed out. Same process, though. Some things appear near when contrasted to something that's not near, far. So wider integration simply change the scale. Now we're going to turn to the ignored category of narrowings. More precise differentiation, she calls them. You can just take a shorter range. You're comparing two blues to a red. OK, now compare two very close blues to a blue that's far away, but still in the blue range. And you get royal blue or deep blue or light blue if you're going the other direction. So you can narrow the range. 
Uh, you can get, um, what are some, ultramarine is a very narrow range of a certain kind of blue. Robin's egg blue is a very light, greenish, almost blue. So you can narrow that, I mean, that's trivial, right? Now we come to the most interesting one, cross-classification. Here you don't just change the scale. Here you bring in something new, maybe from left field. You cross, see how I've brought in the cross, the vertical element there, a new CCD with the old, and that creates a little bit of complexity. So within the new CCD, we also have a range. See the D down at the bottom? That's the foil within the new CCD. And I don't mean that we drop the old, it's still there, and we still got the AB range. We place A on both scales. So I've drawn a little line to indicate where A falls on the new scale. And of course, this left-right position is where it falls on the original CCD. But let's say B falls outside of that category of near measurements that A falls inside of on the vertical axis. Now you've got something like pink to give some content to it. So we've got hue, which is wavelength. We distinguish red from blue with purple as a middle case. Now we bring in how much white is there in that color, added to that color. And it might be zero. You might have monochromatic red, which would be in hex FF0000, all red and no anything else. But if you start mixing in other colors, you're in effect adding white, and pink means a considerable amount of white has been added in. Pretty obvious, right? Cross-classifications are really sophisticated and interesting. Let's look at cross-classifications of man. Philosopher. Now, why is that a cross-classification? Because when we distinguish man from the animals, it was either on the basis of shape, if we were very young, or shape plus they talk, if we're a little older, or a rational animal who survives by means of reason, that's what rational means, if we are Aristotle, if we've progressed to that stage. Now, what if you were to narrow that not by a cross-classification? Well, I guess you could say a rational a lot of the time uses his free will to be very rational, very irrational, and you could make the scale from Ayn Rand to Paul Krugman or Donald Trump, for that matter. Um, but that's not what we're doing when we're saying philosopher. We're bringing in the subject to which he applies his reason professionally to make his living to, as his major purpose in life. So that's a cross-classification. What do you do for a living is not a narrowing of rational animal. It implies a narrowing, because people do different things. It implies a subdividing, but it's not the same CCD that's being narrowed. Or cousin, cousin, narrowing rational animal by the biological relationship through ancestors to someone. Or Baptist, narrowing by a belief about a certain kind of system of nonsense. Or Republican or Democrat or criminal. There's this fine shades of difference here. <laughs> or gamer, to take a new one. Gamer, he's a gamer. He plays a lot of video games. He takes them seriously. I guess it doesn't have to be just video games. He plays a lot of 
the board games or whatever, and he, he's very much, quote, into that. So we make up a category. And that's not a narrowing in the way that man is different from the monkey and the dog. It's a different CCD. So you see that? Walking, if we take an action, is narrowed by a lot of cross-classifications such as strolling, sashaying, parading, galumphing. There are, I found about 20 words for different kinds of walking, all of which narrow it by a different CCD added to movement of a two-legged, well, I guess it could be two or four-legged organism by successive placement of the limbs. Parading is not a narrowing of walking the way that trotting is a narrowing of gait or walking differentiates what we and animals do from a snake slithering. Parading is walking for the purpose of displaying oneself in a proud way. <clears throat> So the cross classifications are very rich, very profuse, and very sophisticated. You, a child can't do them at the beginning. It has to have a lot of concepts of characteristics which are themselves higher order concepts. And we're going to take up next time these special characteristics that are not, uh, sorry, the special concepts that are higher order but are not either narrowings or widenings, at least not in the form that I've discussed them so far. That's going to be concepts of characteristics, which by which I include actions, concepts of consciousness and axiomatic concepts. For just to put my toe in, class four is gonna be on the normative implications of this theory, including now the abstractions from abstractions. Now what do I mean by normative implication? So where's the good and the bad now? I began these series of lectures by saying we've got to protect liberal democracy from corporate imperialism was all screwed up, right? That you can't think with that kind of mental chaos in your cognitive equipment. So that's a value judgment. I'm saying that's bad, that's destructive. Where does that come from? What's the standard? What are the big errors to avoid? What are the big positives to seek out? Those are the normative implications. That's going to be class four. But the base of that is now established. Hierarchy and cross-classifications are the two issues that give rise to all the normative implications of how you should and shouldn't use concepts. Hierarchy is the fact that you can't get to polygon until you've gotten triangle and some other examples of polygons. Cross-classification is that you have a choice. You have a choice of what CCD you use for your vertical axis. So when you distinguish men from dogs and cows and apes and pigs, there's a choice whether you pay attention or not. But there's really not much choice in the content. And we don't find people thinking that pigs are men. And saying, well, you know, I don't see why Porky isn't given rights. Now, they, they have theories of animal rights, but that's because they mess up the concept of rights. But no one thinks that dogs are people. No one has trouble with that, right? No one thinks that scarlet is really a color under yellow. So when we're dealing with this kind of, we call them straight widenings and straight narrowings, 
Your choice is really to pay attention or not. But when we come to cross classifications, you choose what axis to lay across as the vertical to subdivide the CCD you start with. So for instance, you could in politics lay across the axis of uh, human relations is it male dominated or female dominated? You can do that. And then you have patriarchy and matriarchy, right? Bad choice. We'll see why. But you can do that. It's not just a, well, if you look out and you've got your eyes open, you're going to see that matriarchy and patriarchy are the obvious next steps to include. No. Or voting. This is what a little bit better than the matriarchy thing. There's democratic systems in which there's voting, and then there's systems in which there aren't. And in between, there's systems in which there's a little voting, but not enough. And we call the ones with a lot of voting democracy. Not good. Not a good choice of the vertical axis. Whereas if you put force and rights as your vertical axis. There are systems of human interactions where rights are protected and force is banned. Ah, now we're on to something. Why? But you see that there is the good and the bad choice of the cross-classifying characteristic. Cross-classifying characteristic. And in terms of hierarchy, you can not quite get there. You can sort of know what you're integrating and then sort of know what you're integrating that to, which doesn't come up on the first level. You're pretty clear about what's a dog and what's a man. But as to what is a hero and what isn't, that's not so clear. That depends upon the standard of values. So that's hierarchically enmeshed in a whole series of concepts, including cross-classification. So you can see that we have a lot of normative implications coming out of the fact that you have to proceed in hierarchical order if you want your concepts to stay meaningful, and that you choose what cross-classification system you're going to impose upon it, what new CCD you're going to use to subdivide when there's a cross-classification. Now with that just kind of foray into the upcoming normative lecture, let me stop here and take questions. Thank you. Yes. If um, widening is purely a matter of uh, extending your uh, range of mm -hmm. comparison, why do you need to conceptualize the lower level units? If widening is purely a matter of scale, why do you need to conceptualize the lower level units? You don't unless what you have when you zoom back are things that are not perceptually similar. So for instance, you, a child will get animal ahead of schedule, you know, by the theory. That's because for a child, animal means a four-legged, our-sized kind of animal. Four-legged, they mean mammal, more or less, or quadruped, or something like that. But if you take the range of it, and we don't have to get super, you know, we don't have to include a super technical, we don't have to include the sponge and the amoeba. So let's just take it to perceptually uh, available organisms. A fly and an elephant. No child is going to look at the, uh, the flies and the elephant and see them as, oh yes, they're both animals. To the, to the child who uses the term animal from the start, he means mammal, 
quadruped, something like that. And he would never think to call fly an animal. It's a fly. <laughs> you know, it, it, that would be completely foreign. If you are not convinced by that, then you say, well, a really smart kid might get that. I disagree, but let's take living being, organism. So the kid is out walking in the woods, and a deer goes by, and there's moss on, the, on a rock. Now, it's not perceptually evident that those two things belong together any more than the rock belongs with the tree. You know, it was a, a long time before people realized plants were living beings. They thought plants, yeah, plants change, but so do rivers. So there's, when there's no perceptual similarity, you can't just zoom back. If you've got something that remains perceptually similar when you zoom out, you can do it. But there's not much that meets that criterion. Good question. Uh, I have a question about uh, that the essential characteristics of a concept are inside the concretes, like Aristotle said, as opposed to yeah. uh, simply man's method of cognition as objectivism holds. Well, in all kinds of science, like the formation of a concept is always just the first step. And the next step is to ask, well, why are these things similar? Like, why are all the things we classify as lizards similar or a specific type of, uh, like, chemicals? Like, long before uh, people knew about atoms, they were classifying chemicals according to their properties. Mm -hmm. And long before they knew about DNA, they were classifying animals according to their similarities to one another. And what science finds, and if it's done well, is that uh, the explanation for why all these things are similar after they made the category, they do find it inside the objects they're studying. Like DNA is very much inside the lizards, but at a smaller uh, level of magnification. And even like the man being a rational animal, mm -hmm. that too has an explanation. It's inside us, like our brain yeah. is very different from all the non-rational yeah. animals. The inside, say, so don't be, misled by the inside metaphor. The issue is, can you distinguish essence from accident by looking at one concrete? So we're not saying that the essential characteristic isn't possessed by each of the things in the concept. We're saying when you call it essential, you mean relative to something. Now you raise DNA. Okay, DNA of man versus DNA of chimpanzee, 98% similar. So is that essentially the same or essentially not the same? DNA of, of, of man and chimpanzee versus slime mold, a lot of similarities, significant differences. Is it an essential difference or a non-essential difference? You can't answer that question. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton differs from Donald Trump. Is that an essential difference or non-essential? We know the attributes that we're talking about are in the things, but when does an attribute that's in the thing qualify as an essential of that thing, and when doesn't it? And the answer is you can't answer that question that way. It's essential to the thing being of a certain kind. It's a kind relative essence. And if you're talking about man qua, uh, what would be a good category, vertebrate, then the DNA that's still inside him, it's a certain subgroup of alleles that are relevant, or I guess nucleotide bases and pairs, that are relevant, that are essential to as being a vertebrate rather than an invertebrate. The different set of things inside him that qualifies essential for being a mammal versus not a mammal, and another thing for being a human being versus a chimpanzee, and another set 
for being a human being subject to phenylketone urea? What is that? Is some well-known uh, genetic disease. Um, so it's not, we're not saying the, the attribute that counts as essential is outside the person, no. But what makes it qualify as an essential is essential for what? For being a man, for being a mammal, or for being a vertebrate, or for being a solid object versus a liquid? DNA isn't relevant to that. So it's kind relative. It's the thing inside the entity that's relevant to it being classified in this group rather than that group. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, I didn't say the concept is formed on the level of DNA. It's obviously formed on the level of, uh, like, the first level. Well, the same thing applies, see. you know, why is uh, upright essential to man? It isn't if your concept of man includes cows. So you can say, what's essential to this grouping? But nature doesn't tell us these are the human beings and those are the cows. We don't wear labels. I belong in this category, that belongs in that. We draw the lines, right? And something is essential to drawing the line here rather than there. And mammal is a perfectly good concept that includes human being and cow and a lot of other things. And what's essential to being a mammal is that you're in the traditional, you know, you're young, born alive, you have hair somewhere on your body. Uh, and there were four others that Mrs. Christian taught us in seventh grade biology. <laughs> milk. Uh, so um, nourish your young with milk and whatever else they are. And they are, that's essential to you if we're classifying you as a mammal. Different things are essential relative to how you're classifying them. And nature doesn't classify, man classifies. So the essence is relevant to a classification that you are making. All right, I think we should okay, take another. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is cross-classification part of the process of concept formation? Because I can understand how the concept of career could have a spectrum between, say, non-activity or stagnation to productive activity. And then you can have a range of differences between different kinds of productive activity. But I can see how there would be many different ranges of differences between various concretes that don't get to the essential aspects of what a career is. So how can we tell uh, what ranges of differences are essential to the concept? I think that's backwards. If I understand your question, if you're making a certain differentiation, you can ask, what's, what am I doing? What am I using? And the question of essential versus not essential is simply, what's the fundamental way I'm making this division? So it's not that the divisions are here and then we find the essences. It's rather we divide by a certain means and the question of essentiality only goes to what is the fundamental behind how I'm classifying. For instance, Rourke went to the principal behind the dean. So he was already classifying Peter Keating with the dean he already knew there was a certain group of people, but he didn't know what made them. He sensed that they belonged together, but he didn't know what made them as they are. And when he got to the principle of the second hander, he'd gotten to the fundamental, and that was the essential behind his sense that there's something very different about these people and how I function, and I, have a, I gotta pin it down. So first comes the grouping, then comes the quest for identifying how you did it, then comes the quest, is that the fundamental or just the superficial? So I, I didn't really fill in the, uh, the middle step there. Suppose there's a stage at which Rourke said, well, they're, 
They're too much concerned with the past. The dean wants tradition, you know, so he thinks that the, what people have done in the past should govern what we do today. And Keating also is reverent of anything that's old, you know, in, in architecture is by definition good. So they're, they're too uh, focused on the past, right? I mean, we have new materials and new methods and we shouldn't not be redoing the Parthenon, we should be doing what's required for an airline terminal, which has different needs. So that might be a stage you would go through, but that's the stage of, I, got, I see a basis for classifying, but I'm not sure it's the fundamental. And when he gets to the idea they substitute other people's minds for their own, they live secondhand, function secondhand, then he's got the fundamental. So that's usually the way it goes. You, you get a sense, these, I should divide these from those. Well, what's the difference? That states you, what's the difference? Well, these have this character, and this has that, or these have much more of this, and these have just a little. Then, finally, but what gives rise to their having that characteristic? And maybe you've already got it. Maybe there isn't anything more fundamental. But maybe there is. And when there is, you've gotten an, an essential rather than just a distinguishing character. So let me give you a formal statement. The essential character is, characteristic is the fundamental among the distinguishing characteristics. The characteristics which distinguish that group from the other groups within the same category, the same CCD. Okay, okay? thanks. Go ahead. Clarification on cross, um, uh, clarif uh, cross, uh, cross classification. Uh, did you mean it to be a subheading uh, uh, under narrowing? Yes, because, thank you. Yes. Because, but it seems like you could use, you have a choice of different axes, even when you're abstracting from abstraction, so that would be still applicable. It is a different basis, but it's a narrowing. In, in other words, ask yourself, are there more human beings or cousins? More human beings or poets? Poets is a narrowing of human beings. Some, some human beings are poets, some are cousins. Uh, maybe all are cousins in some ultimate biological sense. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so it's a narrowing by adding a new characteristic to narrow what you have before. Uh, it, it's... Um, Definitely a narrowing. I meant it to be a type of narrowing. But as we'll see next time, I don't think concepts of characteristics are either widenings or narrowings. And yet they're higher order in one sense of higher order. So we will take that problem up uh, next time right at the start. Thank you.